All right, good morning, Doug. Uh, today, we'd like I'd like to talk about China a little bit. And it seems this article you shared with me, China just seems like they are whooping our ass in virtually every single category. But why don't you tell us a little bit about what 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 was covered in this article and what your views are? Yeah, I'm a fan of uh, Joe Bob Briggs. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Joe Bob is, I don't know him personally, unfortunately, but uh, his articles occasionally occur in uh, lourockwell.com and uh, a publication called UNS Review, UNZ Review, among other places. Uh, I don't read UNS, but I do uh, read Lou Rockwell. Anyway, uh, Joe Bob had one here that uh, he's, a, he's a, Joe Bob, as you can tell by his name, is just a good old Southern boy. And, but he's, he's very shrewd and basically really sound. So anyway, what Joe Bob says in his article is, uh, his, uh, I poke about the web in the manner of an earnest truffle hound to see what the wily Orientals are doing. It says my results are not too systematic, but my distinct impression is that things are happening over there. And ideas that pop up on Wednesday are in volume production by Friday afternoon. So anyway, what Joe Bob does in this article is, uh, just like you just said, picks a few random things that he found about what China's doing. And I lived in Hong Kong for, God, I don't know, on and off for 10 years. And uh, first, I first visited China in when? 1976, I think, when they were still wearing Mao suits and been back a number of times since then, not recently. But uh, these observations that uh, we're gonna go over from Joe Bob's article, where he's kindly put together a few random things like he says, I think he's spot on. Uh, he's accurate about these things. So the first thing that he's got listed here is um, China's ahead of America. And he, and he references articles. We can link to the article, I, I guess, too. Yeah. Uh, China's ahead of America in patent applications for the second year. And uh, that's a really big deal. Uh, patents indicate the progress that you're making. Inventions, and now more coming out of China, where only two generations ago, they were starving to death and grubbing for roots and berries and, you know, but now, right. yeah, so big change. I mean, well, one of the well, things it's, it's said, it's, it's, sorry, it was said that the uh, the Chinese were really good at copying things and really, you know, maybe improving the efficiency of stuff, but like innovation wasn't happening there. And I think a lot of Americans still think that that's true, that the real technological innovations aren't happening there. But this patent measurement alone sort of shows you that that's not the case at all. They've sort of taken over the leading edge of innovation and, you know, are, are uh, certainly exceeding what's happening in the US for the first time in the last couple of years. It might be worth investigating in more detail because I don't know, but um, I don't think, well, since most Chinese don't have detached houses, they don't have detached garages or for that matter, basements, where you can experiment and do stuff the way you can uh, in America, you know, uh, but, uh, maybe most of their patents are coming out of big organized com companies, which is a different thing than a couple guys in the garage doing that. But still, I don't know. It's uh, yeah, it might be worth looking into. Yeah, wouldn't seem to be good. And then the next thing he's got is China's moving ahead with a huge robot farming project powered by 5G cellular technology. Now this is a big change from barefoot peasants uh, taking out, you know, by hand uh, rice plants that have been fertilized with night soil. So they've advanced a lot, you know, using 5G to, uh, to do that. And then later on, he goes out to point out other things about 5G in China as opposed to in the US where it turns out that we're falling way, way behind. Hmm. 
Yeah, I think one of the, I mean, uh, the 5G technology, and there's a lot of actually controversy about that, well, like what it's supposed to do. Uh, and I don't know. Uh, I think the thing that um, makes it, that, that it allows for is a lot more robotics and automation though, because it allows this huge amount of bandwidth at, you know, uh, like on the sensor, on the local sensor level. So like having robotics and farming for instance, can make a lot of sense with 5G deployed. And, you know, all these uh, efforts to create these smart cities, for instance, also required uh, 5G everywhere in order for that to be deployed. And um, I don't like that 5G from the point of view that it's tracking more individuals. Uh, it, it allows for that to allow um, really precise tracking of virtually everything. But at the same time, on, you know, if, if you, if the amount of potential of, uh, um, improvement in the quality of life and the technology that robotics could offer people is so, so substantial, so high. Um, and we're just going to miss out on that entirely compared to China because they've, they've done it now. Again, I think it's a trade-off. All things are a trade-off, but yeah, you know, just like the, the washing machine and the light bulb, like dramatically improve the standard of living of Americans, uh, all of this robotic stuff can do the same thing and just to deny it out of hand and to just not participate and to be so so dramatically surpassed by another country in that, you know, it could be a mistake. It could be a big mistake. Yeah, I, I've heard the controversy about 5G, and I can understand why it might not be a good idea to be bathed in, uh, you know, constantly bathed in very, very short uh, radiation. Short wave. Yeah. yeah, short wave. I mean, I don't know. And maybe it'll take decades to find out if it really does any damage or not. But, um, you know, I think it's worth a shot. Anyway, it's yeah. kind of academic for me because, you know, I've decided to always live out in the country from mm -hmm. now on. So I'm never going to have 5G out here. So it's kind of academic. So I can, I can evade the uh, question in my case. Of right. course, I don't use a cell phone unless I'm forced to anyway. So, but yeah, good, good point. Chinese are on the right path. I think we're on the wrong path. And it says um, Beijing has powered up its artificial sun nuclear fusion reactor for the first time. I don't hear about what progress is being made, if any, in the US towards fusion. Um, but interesting that the Chinese are pursuing their own path towards it. Interesting. Since the US government is completely and terminally bankrupt. I don't know how they can, well, they can just print money, of course, but that can't go on forever. It takes capital uh, in order to do big science projects like that. So, but of course, the Chinese are in economic and financial problems too. So anyway, still, they're doing it. And I haven't heard anything that we've done recently. What's the next thing that we've got here? Ah. The Global Times, again, a mouthpiece of Beijing, the Global Times, says that China needs to increase its nuclear warhead capacity to 1,000 because of American hostility. And uh, actually, uh, I don't think World War III is going to have much to do with anything that even vaguely relates to what happened in World War II, uh, including nuclear weapons. But he's right. The Americans are really being hostile towards the Chinese uh, floating our boats in the South and East China Seas, which is for them the equivalent of uh, uh, they're floating their boats in the uh, Gulf, Gulf of Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, mm -hmm. or, or right off Santa Catalina Island. So right. yeah, I can understand it. You know, it's it's a pity, but I think we're we're at fault, quite frankly, observing it from a, a Mars high view. And what's the next thing? Ah, this is kind of interesting. Joe Bob points out that in education, China seeks out its brightest students with a grueling entrance of that exam. And of course, that, that dates back to the way that it was done in Confucianist times. Uh, you know, this is nothing new for the Chinese. They're kind of going back to the way they were 2,000 years ago from that point of view. Mm. And in the meantime, America dumbs down 
it's uh, elite high schools because they don't have enough unqualified minorities. And uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, I think we've had things about this in the past where, uh, you know, if you, if you look too bright, you're too white. And uh, yeah, I think everything is being dumbed down and has been for many years in the US. The Chinese are pursuing the opposite thing where they're rewarding the best and the brightest pupils. Okay, good point. Doesn't work well, well for us. The long-term effects of that are really, really substantially bad for the U.S. Because you know, if you if you lower all of the essentially the academic standards, um, you know, what you end up doing is you push out the brilliant people. I mean, you just push them out of the the uh, you know the systems, you know, out of the uh, so the so the so the most brilliant people because they just can't stand it. I mean, they can't stand to be everything so dumbed down. You have people, people like uh, this friend of mine who is probably the smartest human I've ever known, who, um, you know, was pushed out of uh, his last completed grade was sixth, I think, but he has two master's degrees, you know? I mean, it's like, but he just gets pushed out of the educational system because it's too slow. It's too slow for them and too dumbed down. But it's even worse than that because the ones that stay in uh, the American uh, education system now, much more than ever, are being actively indoctrinated in um, things which are counterfactual, counterproductive, uh, politically correct. Uh, the, I don't think this is the case in China. They're not indoctrinated in Marxism, Leninism. They're indoctrinated with learning science and uh, technology. That's what they think schools are for. That's not what we think schools are for. Hmm. So that doesn't well, some, well. I think there is some indoctrination happening uh, based on the you know the Chinese people that I know, but that but that indoctrination is that you know is on that you know that you should pursue actively and aggressively achievement, and that you should make something of yourself for the benefit. You know, a lot of it is within the Confucian framework for the benefit of the family. You know, you have an obligation to work hard and to, to do more and be more and that there's so, but that's, that is a form of indoctrination, but, it it's, is. but it's productive for the, for the, for the society, for sure. And, and productive for the individual from that point of view. I mean, maybe, maybe that's called inculcating good habits in kids <laughs> right. as opposed to you know, thought crimes, which is what we're putting into kids heads here. So very, exactly. very bad signpost for the future. Um, mm -hmm. So let's see the next thing. Oh, this is this relates to that. Joe Bob points out that America tied with China in the 2019 Math Olympiad. I guess there wasn't one in 2020 because of the virus hysteria. So Joe Bob points out, although America tied with China in 2019, uh, well, not exactly, because in 2019, the US team was composed of Vincent Wong, Colin Tang, Edward Wan, Brandon Wang, and Daniel Zhu, and an oddball guy named uh, Luke Robitaille. I don't know what he's doing in there. So it seems that China tied with itself. So. <laughs> <laughs> so further proof of what's, what's going on. And uh, the next thing Jill Bob has is um, uh, I have another example of Mars. Uh, he's talking about the Chinese electric vehicle startup industry, a company called Neil. Uh, it's odd because uh, about three years ago, a friend of mine in, uh, in Aspen, uh, Boogie Wineglass, who uh, who founded uh, Mary Go Brown Enterprises, he had a thousand retail stores, was actually Boogie that started uh, that whole trend of wearing jeans that looked like they were 10 years old with torn knees and so forth. Anyway, hmm. so he, he was on this early, but um, it's true that, uh, you know, the Chinese are way ahead in, uh, electric vehicles. Now you can say that's good, bad, or indifferent. As a car guy, I kind of like electric vehicles. Um, everything being equal, they handle better than uh, 
uh, internal combustion engine vehicles because the batteries are in the floor plate. That's all the yep. weight, low center of gravity. So, and a lot less moving parts. So it's the wave of the future. I don't think there's any doubt about it, but they're way, way ahead in that. So for what it's worth. And then the next thing he points out is China's quantum computer beats Google Sycamore in computational supremacy. Hmm. Well, that's important because quantum computing is uh, going to be as big a deal above um, today's computing as 5G is above 4G for communications. So, what well, is there even? Is there is it is that? I wonder what's it wasn't it like the didn't, when we went from the transistor to the microchip like that was a that was a quantum leap in computing or electronic capability right wasn't that. Yes, uh, and it almost seems to me that this five G is, is even, or not five G, but the quantum computing is 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 even bigger than that jump because the amount of I, I I can't remember the numbers on it, but the amount of processing power that a quantum computing can do compared to you know the today's most advanced computer, it's night and day. I mean, they're they're not even related uh, in terms of the, the the true quantum leap that is produced by that. And it makes things like all of modern encryption, for instance, would be null and void because quantum computing can would be able to crack any encryption that exists today, including you know all the encryption in the Bitcoin blockchain and everything else. So it yeah. it really could change everything in a way that's hard to imagine, solving problems that humans can't even begin to imagine solving with current computing power. Um, and they're kicking our butt in it. They really are, and they've been investing in it for at least a decade that I've been aware of. Yeah. And it's computing on an atomic or even a subatomic level so that, you know, you'll be able to put all the information in the world in a computer the size of a grain of rice, wow. which is appropriate, I guess, for <laughs> the Chinese doing it, not a grain of wheat. Uh, yeah, big deal, big deal. Uh, so whoever does it first and best might be able to conquer the world. And then he mentions that China finishes building the world's largest radio telescope, which is 500 meters across. And uh, that's interesting because uh, I guess we used to have the world's biggest uh, radio telescope, which was the uh, Arecibo Array in Puerto Rico. But that was built like 50 or 60 years ago it kind of blew away in a big windstorm there in Puerto Rico, the last hurricane, and it's not being rebuilt. So um, I guess the Chinese are going to be making a lot more in the way of astronomical discoveries too. Hmm. We won't. Do you think, is there, is there anything that he mentions in this article that the US is still ahead in as compared to China? <sighs> no. No, that's the disturbing thing about it. Uh, well, where we are ahead are the, um, are the well, well, where we were, well, we're not ahead there anymore. And the Chinese, it's, it, it's the basic fundamentals uh, of Western civilization, which got us to where we are. And we're actively trying to wash them away. Um, I think that the progress the Chinese are making is all uh, science and technology. And, and this can be dangerous though, because it's been pointed out that um, science and technology is advancing at a rate faster than Moore's law. I think that's actually correct. Um, but uh, ethics uh, is actually going downhill or hasn't mm -hmm. advanced much at all. So we get to this conundrum of what do you do when you have chimpanzees that are armed with nuclear weapons and stuff even more dangerous than nuclear weapons now that still think like chimpanzees, which we do. So this is all kind of dangerous. But yeah, you're right. Uh, he didn't find anything in his scooting around the uh, internet anecdotally where we were ahead. Can you think of anything? 
I mean, they used to say, uh, we still say that our military is, you know, superior, uh, but I don't know if you can really say that. We might have a larger Navy or we might have, you know, uh, uh, you know, more nuclear weapons. So in, that, in those numerical things, measurements, we might be ahead, but I don't think that those are, that necessarily even means that we would dominate in a, in a hot war. Um, just because there are a lot, I mean, they have hypersonic missiles. They have, you know, all kinds of different things that, um, that's, that that's could right. easily I, be. Yeah, our, our Navy, which would be deployed on the other side of the world. I mean, that's about as smart as Hitler invading the Soviet Union because your supply lines are just too long to keep things going. Whereas the Chinese, when they confront the US Navy off their coast, they're gonna be doing so with land-based facilities. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. And incidentally, uh, who has the largest submarine fleet in the world today? Uh, it's China has the largest submarine fleet in the world. And it's true, they're mostly diesel electric submarines, but in point of fact, diesel electric submarines, except for worldwide continual cruising, are actually more deadly and quieter and, and more efficient uh, than um, nuclear submarines. And now diesel electrics are they're just as fast and can stay underwater for two weeks at a stretch and so forth. So the Chinese are actually uh, moving ahead in that area too. But hmm. this is all junk. I mean, this is all World War II type technology for what it's worth. But uh, so where, it, We'll get back to that in a minute when we talk about, he does say something about the, uh, uh, the B-23 bar, bar, or is it the B-21? Yes, that's what it is. So um, anyway, another thing, maglevs. So uh, I guess Elon Musk is working with this boring company on a super high speed uh, underground, like uh, vacuum tube um, passenger carriers. Hyperloop. Yes, exactly. Very nice. But uh, fact is, as Joe Bob points out, that uh, you know the Chinese have lots of maglev and you know high speed rail, and uh, we have exactly zero miles, zero miles on the way, unless Elon gets lucky. Ah, and here's where he points out. But what we are spending on is a B twenty one intercontinental nuclear bomber old technology again, costing $550 million a piece. You know, I used to make a joke that, yeah, sure, we can build all this stuff. The Chinese will lend us the money to do it, but they're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. they, don't want all, they don't want the U.S. government's questionable paper. So it's actually the U.S. government has to sell bonds to the Federal Reserve to print money to pay for this stuff. So this is going to end badly. That's what we're spending our money on, something that's totally non-productive. And then next thing that Joe Bob comes up with is he says, um, China will begin constructing its space station this year. And um, okay, that's interesting. The Chinese are gonna have their own space station, not an international space station where you're coordinating with a bunch of other countries. They're gonna have their own space station. And did you read that book? Um, oh goodness, it, it was a bestseller a couple of years ago and it was made into a movie with Matt Damon about a guy oh, who gets Mars. on Mars. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yes, I did read it. Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember what is it. I thought it was just called Mars, but maybe not. Um, yeah. Yeah, anyway, I know what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, it was written. It was written by an American who's, uh, you know, a um, an aficionado of space progress. But one of the interesting things that he points out in that book, which is, I guess, at this point about three or four years old, is that uh, the Chinese step in to save the day uh, by launching another rocket, which, you know, saves this guy's bacon. So the Martian. The Martian is what it's called. The Martian, right. Yeah, it was actually actually a, a very entertaining and scientifically, I think, accurate read. So I agree. The movie That's great. Too. Anyway, the Chinese saved the day for uh, 
<laughs> for the Martians then, and with their own space station, where they don't futz around with other countries. Interesting. And then let's see, China to build 30 fully connected 5G factories by 2023. I, I don't know what we're doing in that regard, but since they're vastly ahead of, uh, of the US in terms of, of 5G, which uh, as far as Americans concerned, as Joe Bob points out, is mainly the ability to download movies faster. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it just shows you know, where the average American's head is at as opposed to what's going on with the Chinese. They're catching up in artificial intelligence. Yeah, let's see, here's something interesting. He points out that China developed a hydrogen fuel cell hybrid locomotive and it's coming off the assembly line. Interesting, innovation, probably work because it's a locomotive. So <clears throat> carrying fuel and all that. So no more using diesel, which, which we have to use. Or... Okay, interesting. Uh, and let's see, and he goes on talking about Huawei, which is of course the enemy of all right thinking Americans now. Uh, I'm using a Huawei device right now in Uruguay. Works fine, incidentally. Um, but uh, Joe Bob points out, and of course, I'm not, I'm not terribly in to um, cell phone technology and things of that nature. But he points out that uh, Trump cut the company off uh, to kind of save Google's bacon. So it appears that Huawei is developing its own um, system to compete with uh, Google and Android so that, uh, you know, does it really make a lot of sense to, uh, you know, instead of having your adversary use your product, try to cut them off and they're big enough and smart enough and resourceful enough to create their own uh, Android lookalike, which since it's brand new, the world will probably go to and that's another American industry. Of course, most of our stuff is made over there anyway. So sure. another strategic error on the part of Trump and his uh, successors. So what else has he got here? I mean, he brings up a lot of stuff about uh, the Chinese in, in the uh, chip and wafer industry uh, seem to have developed a flash chip, which is a big deal. Uh, that's um, yeah, that they're, it seems like they're producing in massive quantities. So what's gonna happen to um, uh, Intel and uh, AMD and these other American chip companies? Gee, they might be in trouble. So it's one thing after another, you know, that's funny. Do you remember some years ago, it, it's rather quaint when you think of it now that, uh, that uh, it was a meme in the US when we were building all these factories abroad, um, said, uh, let them work, we'll think. Right. Well, that, didn't work out, that, that didn't work out too well, kind of backfired. So now they got, they got the factories and they're thinking, and I guess we're just consuming uh, uh, Marvel movies at this point. Exactly. Yep. We yeah. definitely we definitely are a consumer society. Definitely everything is consumption oriented. And I think people are even so disconnected from it, from production in general that they don't even understand that uh, we talked about this before. Americans are kind of a cargo cult. You know, and we just everything shows up in the grocery store, everything we want, where does it come from? It comes from the store. You know, we don't we we have no concept for how things are produced. And we it's not part of our culture. Yeah, exactly. We think hey, we're a consumer society. Like that's something to be proud of. But uh, like Musk pointed out, hey, if you wanna have stuff, you gotta make stuff. And as, as Joe Bob's been talking about here, we don't make stuff much anymore. Mm -hmm. So what's the next thing here? He's talking about, um, oh yeah. So uh, 5G base stations in China could reach more than 1.7 million by the end of next year. So uh, I guess we have some uh, 
5G base stations if you want them in the big cities. Okay, but not much. Um, uh, let's see. This is kind of funny. China out front in race to reduce CO2 emissions. So 40% of the world's new solar power generation is constructed there. Hmm. Um, okay. I'm all for solar power. It's advanced tremendously uh, in the last few decades. So that it's actually like economic if it's used in the right places, which is generally mm -hmm. not. It's used in the most ideologically convenient places, but not places that, you know, where the sun's out a lot. And um, anyway, I, you know, it seems to me that solar is great for specific applications, not everywhere, but for specific yes. applications, it's great. But um, anyway, the Chinese, for what it's worth, are doing, doing a lot there. And, and since they don't believe in this global warming meme and all the rest of it, I'm sure that the solar that they're deploying, the wind they're deploying, is not for ideological reasons. It's because it's actually economic. It makes sense. Right. Yeah. So, I don't know. Where are they missing the boat? Uh, for, at least from a scientific <laughs> point of view, I, I don't see it. I think you're right. I think it is maybe you know if they're if they're missing the boat anywhere, it's it's uh, you know on the the uh, evolution of ethical an ethical framework that you know allows humanity to flourish, allows individuals to really flourish, and maybe they're maybe that's where it is. But you know, one we started talking before this call about the the reason my my idea on the reason as to why a culture can can uh, ascend because we someone asked this question in our Q&A last week, they said, well, uh, cultures fail. We talked about why or why civilizations fall, but why did they rise? What are the things that drive them to rise? And the, I think the thing that, that I mentioned was is exactly what the Chinese are doing that Americans don't. The Chinese are working for the future. They, they re, they're building things for the future. They have an attitude toward, a, a view toward the future. They have a, you know, they, they, have a, they have very specific plans that are, you know, that are published and communicated about where they want to be by 2030, by 2050. And, you know, we don't have that. I don't think Americans, you know, I don't, I, we talked about big infrastructure projects here in the U S and I, you know, I can barely remember any that were started and completed in my lifetime. I think the big dig in you know, Boston was one of them, which was, of course was a disaster in many ways. Um, but other than that, it's like, we can't even, I mean, the roads are garbage. I mean, I just drove from Texas, drove here from Colorado. The roads are terrible, um, but I did see enormous amounts of wind farms, by the way, in Texas. Unbelievable. I couldn't believe the miles and miles of, it was, uh, it was, it was strange. But anyway, I think Americans don't believe in the future. What, what do you think about that idea is that as a difference between what fundamentally what's driving the Chinese and, and the Americans? Well, I think the Americans idea of the future at this point has to do with diversity, you know, putting basically unqualified people, or let's say people that are qualified mainly because of their race and gender on corporate boards and positions of power and every place. So, you know, that's our idea of progress today and not science and technology. So actually we're headed backwards. Emphasizing, emphasizing racism, drawing the attention to the, to the fact, hey, this guy looks different from me. We're, hmm. You know, it, it was getting to the point in America that, yeah, so the guy's, you know, a different race. So what? But now it's like the thing that they're. Yeah. So we're going backwards. But isn't that isn't that really even that like we were talking about nihilism earlier? Isn't that really just nihilism? It's d destroying what is and the and thinking that's progress. I mean, isn't that really? Yeah, exactly. They want to they want to destroy absolutely all the good things from Western civilization, but they don't have any idea what what they really well. I guess what they want is a socialist utopia, and it's like they've learned absolutely nothing from the experience of the the Chinese and the Soviets. They've learned absolutely nothing. Or it's I amazing. guess they they're going to be in charge, 
So therefore, it's a good thing. And we're dealing, we're dealing with seriously psychologically aberrated people. We really are. They're actually crazy. Hmm. What's amazing is that the Chinese certainly have learned the Chinese lesson uh, from you know, communism. They learned. They learned and, and they are, you know, I think they're actually laughing at how stupid these guaylos are. And they're right. Mm -hmm. The guaylos well, are I, stupid. And I really, and I really believe, I mean, there's, I, I've heard Chinese tell me this, that, you know, this uh, hundred years of humiliation that the Chinese suffered under the West, you know, from the opium wars and so on. And you really, and the Chinese are, are they're, they're smart. Like you can, whatever you think about them, I trust me, they're smart and they have, a, they have a long-term view of the future. And it, got, it does seem like a lot of the things that are, that are occurring does seem to be revenge in a way. Or just you know they're trying to humiliate us. I mean the anal swabs of probes of the of all U.S. diplomats yeah. to go in the country now. I mean it's just subjecting them to these humiliations, and they laugh, they must laugh about it. They must think it's hilarious. You're right. I mean I'm reading a book right now. Uh, I'd say it's the best book I've ever read read on on ancient Greece, and I've I've actually read quite a few. Um, and I think it's harder to get a grip on ancient Greek history than it is ancient Roman history. But it's very, you know, it's called The Rise of Athens. And I forget the name of the author right now, he's a Brit. But uh, I recommend it highly because it's uh, an excellent big sweep of um, Greek history. Basically from, from the, uh, the Battle of Marathon with, against the Persian Empire to the collapse of the Athenian Empire a hundred years later. And it's interesting because the author makes some good observations. And one thing that he says, is that the Persians uh, remembered the fact that the Greeks humiliated them back in the early days. And by God, they wanted to get even because, uh, you know, hey, you did that to my grandfather and I don't like it. Mm. So maybe the Chinese are gonna be thinking that way too. Well, and like the, the Romans in Carthage, like, you know, the, they, they destroy the city, salt the earth, so nothing will grow there again. It took them like <laughs> a generation to get there, but they did it. That's, that's, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's lots of things like that. So that's why it's a bad idea to go out of your way to try to destroy other people, because uh, unless you do it totally and absolutely, you're going to reap the whirlwind someday. Yep, I think we are now. We're just starting to see it with China, and it'll be interesting to see if uh, if the this pace of uh, differentiation in their um, progress, if it increases from here, it seems like it will, because we're stuck in our own quagmire of political correctness and silliness and uh, self loathing, you know, that we all have at this point. But uh, we better get ourselves together quickly if we want a chance to not be dominated um, by China. Very, history. very unlikely, because trends in motion tend to stay in motion. And this one is still accelerating. So, but uh, there's a few other articles that I've come across that were just so intensely stupid that uh, maybe we can talk about them in the next few days and go through them line by line. That uh, you know, but these things are being accepted as fashionable and correct memes in American society right now. Yeah, we will talk about those as, as I, they do. They do combine with this because it's way that our story is being spun and told in the press to ourselves, to us, you know, about what we should be doing and what is right and wrong and, you know, what our future should look like. And you have some, there's some good ones we'll get into. So we'll talk about those over the course of the week, but um, I think we'll leave the, the Chinese conversation here for now and we'll see what they, uh, what industry they take on next or what part of uh, technology they'd start to dominate us in next. But it's oh, we not just the surface. We could talk a lot more about this, but for the future. All right, great. Well, thanks, Doug. I appreciate it. Talk soon. Thanks.